Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone joining us for this fourth and final week of our third annual African Parliamentarians Forum. As you know well by now, my name is Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly, uh, and I'm the faculty lead for this program. We have an excellent lineup of panelists for you today for our discussion on outreach, bringing civil society and constituents into security policymaking. But before we get to that, let me just, as I usually do, highlight a few points about where we left off last week to refresh your memories. As we have discussed throughout the program, the quality of parliamentary oversight is a function of three basic elements, ability, authority, and attitude. And last week, our discussions focused on how these three factors affect legislative oversight of corruption and governance in the security sector, as well as the ethical and professional conduct and behavior of the security forces. So as you may remember, Dr. Afori Mensa from Transparency International's security and defense team spoke to us about the Global Defense Integrity Index, which measures corruption risks in different countries' defense sectors around the world, including the trend of um, rising African defense expenditures while parliamentary oversight is not intensifying accordingly. Partially, this is because of a history of what Dr. Afori Mensa called defense exceptionalism. Doctors Wadrogo and Ms. Kemi Okinyoto talked in greater depth uh, as well about these issues of military professionalism and police accountability for their behaviors and for their adherence to codes of ethics that should influence their conduct. And we heard in particular about the case of Nigeria um, and recent legislation clarifying roles and responsibilities of different police organizations. We also heard a little bit about Burkina Faso and uh, neighboring Mali from Dr. Wadrogo. Overall, there were a few themes or insights that stood out. Uh, effective transparency and accountability measures involve, of course, not only parliament, but a whole ecosystem of state oversight institutions and civil society. But parliamentarians and their staff need to be familiar with all of these institutions and their specific mandates in their countries and come up with strategies for getting information from them. Uh, and to work with them to address various technical aspects of defense and security policy. We also talked about how disclosure of information by the government, by oversight institutions, and by civil society um, is needed in greater detail, usually, and in a greater volume to make legislative oversight easier. Um, but the communication and engagement gaps between members of parliament, their staffers, and then researchers in many African countries are still wide. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today in the outreach session. Parliaments can also try to create their own information uh, that could be useful for conducting oversight. Uh, so for instance, oversight visits to police barracks in some countries have been really crucial for MPs to familiarize themselves with the practical concerns that citizens are having related to security force conduct and ethics. Uh, in some countries like South Africa, there have been visits that have been conducted on the committee level to do this kind of work and to generate new information for oversight. We also heard some examples from the small group discussions about different ways that members of defense and security committees in places like Democratic Republic of Congo, Senegal, Nigeria, and Ghana are trying to build trust across party lines in parliament uh, with civil society in order to get more information or with various ministries as they're asserting more authority and deepening their ability to do oversight work. Finally, there are two other resources that participants in this forum shared with us last week and we want to share and disseminate to all of you. One is uh, resources, the SADC Parliamentary Forum's Democratic Benchmarks, which provide minimum standards on the constitutional and legal frameworks and the institutional, financial, material, and human resource requirements for democratic parliaments. Um, I know that um, Kimberly, one of our speakers today, helped to work on this, and we also have um, participants who have worked on um, the tools um, and the standards set in this benchmarks document. We will share that a link in the chat for those of you who are interested in consulting that resource. Um, we also have a model law on policing uh, passed in 2019 by the Pan-African Parliament. And in light of our policing accountability discussion from last week, um, one of our participants suggested that we share this with everyone. So that link will also be shared with you. 
Um, and then uh, just to promise you, since it's the last plenary session for all of us together, there have been a, quite a few resources that participants have shared with us for dissemination to all of you. So we will provide you a list of all the resources that have been shared by participants after the program and make sure that we send that along to you too. We encourage you in the meantime, if you wish to add to this list and would like to send us your articles or tools that you're using or created uh, to, to do your work, um, please share them with us, um, either through your discussion group facilitators tomorrow or other ACSS staff that um, you're in contact with here as we're finishing up the program. With that, I think we will move on to today's panel entitled Outreach, Bringing Civil Society and Constituents into Security Policymaking. I am now being joined on the dais by our speakers, Dr. Joseph Asunka, Ms. Kimberly Smitty, and Dr. Christopher Femunio. The plenary panel today has the following objectives. We hope that we will consider the ways that parliaments and parliamentarians can help governments advance security policies that reflect the interests of constituents and incorporate civil society expertise. We hope to compare and contrast different ways that parliamentarians can engage with civil society and bring constituents into security policymaking and oversight, whether that's through side visits, research consultations, or otherwise. And we also hope to analyze what tools parliamentarians and staffers have to enhance their communications with constituents and communities about security and defense policies and issues. I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panelists. Dr. Joseph Asunka, has served as CEO of Afrobarometer since April, 2021. He was previously a program officer in the Global Development and Population Program at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, where he managed a portfolio of grants that support efforts to increase transparency and accountability in fiscal governance and foster citizen participation to improve public services in developing countries. Joseph was also previously a lecturer in political science at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he got his PhD and taught courses on African politics, political economy of development, research methods, and data analysis. Before that, he was an officer at Ghana's Center for Democratic Development, which is a core partner of the Afrobarometer surveys, which we'll be talking about today. And he was data manager for Afrobarometer before getting his PhD at UCLA. So welcome, Dr. Asunka. We also have Ms. Kimberly Smitty, who is Program Manager for Southern Africa at the International Republican Institute and a Democracy and Governance Specialist with expertise in parliamentary development and legislative strengthening in Africa. This includes 19 years on the continent. She was formerly the Co-Executive Director of the Institute for Parliamentary Support in Africa, which she also co-founded. And Kimberly has conducted trainings and managed capacity building projects on subjects including parliamentary outreach and civic education, best practices for holding public hearings and enhancing formal systems of accountability. She's also interestingly enough been chief of party for Malawi's parliamentary oversight systems initiative, which involves supporting committee chairpersons and staff in documenting best practices on vertical accountability to constituents. She's also done consulting in the National Assembly of Botswana in the committee section and with the Sadiq Parliamentary Forum documenting the democratic benchmarks that I mentioned previously. So Kimberly's worked with USAID, UNDP, Afrobarometer, University of Cape Town, and other partners on a range of African parliamentary issues, including in 17 countries on the continent. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Christopher Fumunio who is Senior Associate and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute. He has organized and advised international election observation missions to many different countries on the continent. He has also designed and supervised country-specific democracy support programs with civic organizations, political parties, and legislative bodies in many different countries. I'll just read you part of the list. Benin, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Ivory Coast, DRC, Ghana, uh, Guinea, Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal. Um, so many countries that have participants in the forum this year. In the course of his work, Dr. Fumunio interacts regularly with heads of state and government, cabinet ministers, elected officials, and civic leaders, 
And he recently designed and helped launch the African Statesman Initiative, which is a program aimed at facilitating political transitions in Africa by encouraging former democratic heads of state to stay involved in humanitarian issues, conflict mediation, and other key development sectors. Finally, as an expert on democratization in Africa, Dr. Fumunio has made frequent appearances on radio and television networks like CNN or BBC, Voice of America, uh, RFI, um, and he provides interviews regularly for these major uh, newspapers and, um, and other entities. He finally is um, uh, from Cameroon and founder of a nonprofit organization interested in supporting democracy and humanitarian causes there. So um, welcome to all three of our illustrious panelists. Um, I think we're ready to launch right into our moderated panel discussion. And we'll start with Dr. Asunka. Um, so Joe, um, because you're dealing with large amounts of public opinion data from the Afrobarometer surveys that you oversee in over 30 different African countries, we have asked you to do a short presentation with slides. So these slides are available. Um, Joe will be showing them in English, but we also have them translated into French and they'll be available through a link in the chat for our French speakers to click on and follow along with in French. So please look at the chat for the links. So Joe, in your presentation, we've asked you to briefly explain um, to our participants what the Afrobarometer is, why it could be a useful tool for parliamentary work, We've asked you as well to explain what the Afrobarometer tells us about the security and governance concerns that citizens have and that parliamentarians might want to be aware of. And we've asked you to discuss um, what the surveys reveal about citizens' perceptions of legislatures and particularly their trust in members of parliament. So overall, are there any lessons that African parliamentarians can learn from the Afrobarometer about how to strengthen their oversight roles in ways that serve citizens. Um, I will turn the floor over to you for uh, uh, you know about uh, 15 minutes uh, to present your, your slides and present on these questions. Great, thank, thank you so much, Catherine, for the introduction and thank you for the great overview of what you've been doing in the past few days. It's really helpful to get a full picture of it. So thank, thank you for that, that summary, it's really useful. As you said, I'm going to make a short presentation of what the Afrobarometer is and then present some of the data on people's views and perceptions of their parliaments and members of parliament in the African continent, at least for the countries that our surveys cover. And the results I'll be presenting will be mainly the most recent survey, which was conducted between 2019 and 2021. But I'll have some overtime trends in terms of directions in which some of those uh, views have uh, helped some of those views have shifted. So I titled this, How Africans View Their Parliaments and MPs. And I think this will be useful in the sense of just getting a fuller picture or at least a general picture of the trends or patterns that in which um, citizens on the continent engage with their parliaments and how they view parliaments and their members of parliament. So first of all, about the Afrobarometer, and I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards. And I, as Kat said, the slides are available, so you can take a look at them. The, the details is in that, uh, what I shared, they will share with you. So we are a Pan-African Nonpartisan Survey Network. We provide data on people's experiences, evaluations, and aspirations on the continent. Often when we talk of public opinion surveys, people only think about opinions, but these are, both opinion, I mean opinions, in addition to their experiences and how they evaluate things and their own aspirations and the like. And so it goes beyond just opinions. And the goal, overall goal is to give the public a voice in public policy making, because we believe that if democracy is going to be about the people and for the people and with the people, it has to include their voices in policy making. And we have now become the leading source of public attitudes data on the continent to date. So this is where we work. Um, so all the colored in countries, are countries we've done some work in, the gray shaded areas are the places where we've not been able to conduct surveys. And I can just explain why some of these countries are, we have not been able to enter, but partly political situation because you know, conducting these surveys, you really want the researchers to be safe and sometimes some places are not very safe. Other parts is also a function of you know, census data, whether or not the country has recent census data, which allows us to draw a, a, a truly representative sample. We started in 1999 in the orange shaded countries, 
and we have evolved over time to cover all these countries. We're hoping to do Mauritania this year. And so the, the whole top part of Africa will be covered. And then we are also working to get into the central part of Africa going forward. All right, so the question that I'm trying to respond to now is the roles that Africans expect their MPs to play, the extent to which parliaments are actually fulfilling some of these expectations and how citizens evaluate their own MPs in terms of responsiveness and trustworthiness. So first of all, I'm going to begin with just policy priorities and I would say why I want to start here. So when we ask Africans about their priorities in terms of policy, for the past 10 years consistently, we saw that unemployment was always the top priority in most of the countries we cover. In the last round of the survey, which was in 2019 to 2021, we covered 34 countries and still we had unemployment rising up to the top. But I want to emphasize that this continental view actually masks the picture a bit because when you break it down to the country level, there are some countries where we've seen crime and security rise to the top. And as these are mostly countries in the Sahelian region, I saw Burkina Faso and Mali here as an example. But if you look at our data in terms of what people think should be the top priority, it varies by country. And then when members of parliament want to say which countries really prioritize crime and security, I do think breaking it up down by the country makes sense. So if you look, for example, in Burkina Faso, unemployment is at 20%, while crime and security is at 55%. And so it does indicate that that's a big concern for the uh, people of Burkina Faso. All right, so now let me turn to parliament as a key institution, how African citizens view parliament as a key democratic institution. First, we ask our respondents about the legislature and whether or not they should have full oversight over the president. And if you look across the continent, on average, across 33 countries that we asked this question, a majority endorsed this view that parliament should always monitor the president. It's only in a few countries where we have less than majority, that is Tunisia, Mozambique, and Angola, where we have 48 to 49%. But for the most part, parliament oversight over the executive is a solid support majority opinion on the continent. The second thing we ask our respondents is how often the president ignores parliament. Here we do see, again, a majority feeling that the president never or rarely ignores parliament, which gives us a signal that African citizens believe that their parliaments are doing their job because the president <clears throat> doesn't necessarily ignore them. Or thought another way that the president, most of our presidents you now commit to the rule of law and then seeing parliamentary oversight as a responsibility of the, of the government. And of course, making sure that the people's representatives are the ones that are overseeing the president. And so here, as I said, 58% in support and to thinking that the president doesn't necessarily you know, ignore parliament. But then how do they then appraise their members of parliament? Do they think they are doing the right things? Do they see them as representing their views and aspirations? First of all, we ask them about their trust. How trustful are the members of parliament? And this is the picture we get. And I put them here vis-a-vis -vis other leaders just for, to, to show where members of parliament or the National Assembly lies. Across several of these institutions, democratic institutions, 41% of Africans say they trust their parliaments. But this, if you compare it to, of course, the president is at 51%, religious leaders always come on top as the most trustworthy leaders in our communities. But of course, 41%, we do think that's a reasonably high number. We prefer it to be a majority view and hopefully parliament will do well to improve their standing before, I mean, in the eyes of their citizens. All right, so the other thing we ask is, and I was here just a breakdown by country in terms of trust in parliament. So usually the continental pictures tends to mask some of the details in terms of the variation across countries. If you look at the cross country variation, at the top of it, of course, um, Tanzanians are most trusting of their members of parliament. And then 
the, in Tunisia and Lesotho, you have less than a quarter. Actually, from Liberia, Gabon, Tunisia, and Lesotho, less than a quarter saying that they trust their members of parliament. How has this varied over time? Over the last 10 years, I think the worrying trend is that this, the trust levels have been declining and it has actually declined quite significantly from a majority view in 2011 down to only 41% on average. So it does seem like trust in parliament is, has been declining over time. We are currently in the field with our survey and we're not sure where the next picture will be could go up or down. And if it keeps going down, of course, that would be a worrying concern. All right. The other question we ask is about the approval of the job performance of different um, institutions. Here we look at the president, local government councillors, and members of parliament. And unfortunately, members of parliament trail the two institutions that we select here. The president is on top, local government com councillors come next, and then members of parliament are below there. I know that my colleagues on the panel here will talk about some of the practical realities of why this might be the case, and hopefully we'll have some practical ideas as to how MPs and you know, the legislature on the continent might improve on this image. All right, so here I'm breaking it down by country just so that you see the cross-country variation because as I said, the averages are usually masking. So 39% on average, but as low as 19% in Lesotho and very high when it comes to um, Tanzania. All right, but then here too, I just put a chart in terms of approval and disapproval. So what we've seen is approval is going down and disapproval tend, tend to be going up. So as at this point, over 10 years, the proposal actually become a majority position and that is quite concerning. All right, in terms of their interactions with their members of parliament, and I'll end soon, um, we asked how often, whether or not people have contacted their member of parliament in the last year. And I know Kat mentioned this in terms of uh, engagements with members of parliament. Here we see that a dismal 9% say they have interacted with their members of parliament in the last year, compared to traditional leaders where it is almost getting to half of Africans. Of course, this is understandable in terms of proximity, but then at 9% in you know, a proportion of Africans contacting their members of parliament is pretty low. All right, so when you break this down by country, the picture is still the same. Lots of people have never contacted their member of parliament. It goes from as low as 5% in Tunisia and at least quite a bit high with countries at the top there from Botswana and going up where you have more than 15%. But for most countries, is you know is under twenty percent. All right. So here I just show a picture of overtime trend. This trend has been almost the same over time since two thousand and eleven. There's, there's always a majority that say they've never contacted their member of parliament in the last year. It's not been a recent phenomenon. It, has, it looks like it has been so over time. The other question we ask is whether their MPs make time to listen. And here too, we see there's a huge gap. 85% say members of parliament only or sometimes, you know, or they only sometimes listen to them or they never listen at all. The picture is quite okay in Mozambique where you have 23% saying MPs listen. Otherwise, for the most part, people don't think that their members of parliament listen to them. All right, and here just showing the gap in terms of overtime trends, starting at 81% in, 2011, when we started these, I mean, in the last 10 years, and then up to 85% today, it just remained roughly the same over time. So listening to the, the citizens on the continent doesn't seem to be a strong um, thing when it comes to people's views about how MP, whether or not MPs listen. All right, so just the key conclusions from this. Of course, public support for oversight is very strong and high on the continent, and so, at least that should give members of parliament the confidence that the people believe that you should have oversight over your president, you should have oversight over the affairs of the nations. It's just that the trust in MPs performance and evaluations are quite low, and this has been declining over time. And especially when it comes to responsiveness and then contact rates, 
those are really, really very low across the continent. And so there seem to be an, a representation gap in this case, because if you look at the gap between what people say, they, they, the rates of contacts is much lower than um, across, the, across all countries, the rates of contact is very low. So the question becomes, how can MPs close this gap? And I know that my colleagues on the panel will talk about some of the practical ways that we can um, close this gap. So thank you, Kat, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Asuka. And I will just add, um, you know, I think one reason, one thing that's really compelling about the Afrobarometer as a data source in relation to these findings that Joe has just presented is that, as he mentioned at the beginning, these are representative samples of people who are surveyed in each African country, such that you can extrapolate about um, across the country what the public opinion trends generally are. And so there's a really rigorous statistical methodology that the Afrobarometer experts use. And then they go door to door um, to do these survey interviews with um, ordinary citizens in the 34 countries where they've done the latest round. And so it's a really, um, with, with, with African teams of statistical experts and political scientists and, and, and others. So it's a really compelling data source um, in, in, in my view um, for getting at some of these questions that we're discussing today. So thanks again for, to Joe for explaining a little bit of that. You may get more questions about that in the Q&A um, and also for um, highlighting some of these trends and trust that are really important to our panel today. I think now I will turn to uh, a, a more moderated conversation with our remaining panelists, Dr. Fumunio and Ms. Smitty. And so um, I'd like to start with Chris. Um, Chris, if I could start by asking you to speak for six or seven minutes on the following. I mean, as we all know, parliamentarians have an important representational role to play and their political parties are supposed to be vehicles for advancing the interests of citizens through legislative channels on security and defense issues, among other things. So. Why are citizen representation and the articulation of citizen interests important things for security sector oversight and accountability? And what tools do you think parliamentarians have to enhance communications with constituents about security issues and policies? I'll hand it over to you for six or seven minutes here, Chris. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly, for the very kind introduction and thanks, Joe, for uh, getting us started with very uh, meaningful data from Afrobarometer. Uh, it's really fascinating to see the impressions of Africans about their members of parliament and the role that they think uh, parliamentarians ought to play. Uh, let me also say that uh, this conversation uh, is taking place within a global context of a decline in democracy, the democratic deficit or decline that we've all observed in the last decade. And I think in some ways, this also pegs beautifully or accurately with the data that Joe just shared with us, saying that by 2011, the parliamentarians scored highly on some of the indicators. But since then, the trends have been moving rather downward. What we've seen across Africa during this period of democratic decline is not just in parliaments losing their ability to exercise their functions and roles and responsibilities. It's also been in the weakening of the democratic space to such an extent that citizens have lost voice and the military has found itself in some countries compelled to intervene in the political and governance processes. This cause for the most part are a manifestation of the lack of functionality of the pillars that Africans have expected of their democratic societies. So when people have looked at parliaments, they have noted that even when citizens grapple with issues of social well-being, poverty, crime, um, unemployment with youth, that parliaments have for the most part been silent and have been unable to take initiatives to in enact legislation that would respond to these citizen concerns. That there's still a tendency in most of our parliaments to defer to the executive branch of government for solutions, whereas in our constitutions, parliaments or legislative branches 
are treated as co-equal branches of government. Citizens also see that even when governments are uh, conducting themselves poorly, that parliament tends to be silent. I was intrigued by uh, Joe's observation that citizens expect parliaments to exercise oversight over the president, but this oversight has to be exercised over the entire executive branch and executive branch agencies. So it's not just the president and the president's office or his conduct of public affairs, it is also the other line ministries in how they implement policies, in how they execute government budgets. And that includes, as we all would agree, the Ministry of Defense, which in many countries tends to have a high percentage of the national budget and tends to have enough personnel and equipment that are covered in those budgets. The lack of trust in parliaments also comes up as citizens see that in the third leg of the three-legged strategy that captures the roles and responsibilities of parliaments, citizens see that their voices are not heard. They don't feel represented. And of course, the, the data from Afrobarometer did state that less and less citizens are able to reach out and contact members of parliament. And I'm sure that if we broke it down further, we would see that even on the low percentage, I think in one year was, in one country was probably 9% that reached out to parliamentarians, even a, a smaller number of that chunk had their issues resolved or taken up by the parliamentarians. As I travel across the continent, I run into citizens who very often say, that they haven't seen their parliamentarian since the last election. And they know that he, mostly he, but also he or she will show up again a few months before the next election. That is a trend that needs to be corrected if we want our democratic institutions to function properly. Let me also uh, situate our conversation in the context of what we see in the security sector and the realization that the instability and insecurity that many African countries now face, it doesn't come from interstate conflict, something that we had all feared would happen in the early 60s or at independence. Most of the instability and insecurity is being generated within national borders, which means that there's a clear role for national actors, domestic national actors, to be able to impact forcefully and uh, positively in the resolution of those conflicts. It also means that civilian populations get caught up in the process and in their interaction with security services may have grievances that need to be tackled or resolved. Along those lines, I want to say that when you have the conversation about security sector reform, it does really touch on the interface that should exist between security services and civilian populations. And what role members of parliament can have in that process being part of the policy making body in terms of legislation and oversight, but also being the voice of citizens whose desires, interests, and concerns need to be taken into consideration. So with that background, let me just touch on three tools, which I think could be very useful for members of parliament, and that would be very relevant for our conversation today. The first tool that comes to mind is side visits. The fact that members of parliament have to realize that they're not members only when they're in the chambers, when they're in the parliament building or in the national assembly. They're members of parliament 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the rules of procedure and the standing orders of legislative bodies whether they're parliaments or national assembly, allow them 
to be able to go outside of the capital city across the country to meet with citizens to get their input on policy related matters, to see for themselves how the national budgets that they may have voted for the Ministry of Defense, for the police, for the judiciary, how those budgets are being implemented by the line ministries. Let me take a very brief example of Mali. And the reason I bring up Mali is that today, we all lament the fact that Mali is struggling on the military role. It is true that between independence and now, Mali had been ruled by the military for more years than it was ruled by civilian democratically elected governments. But the interim, the interregnum, the period during which Mali experienced meaningful democratic rule from 1993 to 2012 was actually marked by Mali's recognition on the global stage as a democratic society and a founder of one of one of the founders of the community of democracies, which was a global network of democratic countries. And one of the highlights of that period was the security sector reform that was undertaken in Mali that was spearheaded in large part by the members of parliament who decided to visit all the military barracks of the country to see for themselves the living conditions of Malian soldiers in the barracks. And when they came back from those site visits, they actually wrote legislation that gave more resources, that allocated more resources to the Ministry of Defense, which was surprising to many uh, onlookers and specified that a lot of those resources had to go towards improving the conditions of soldiers and personnel within the security services. And that piece of reform did create a bonding between civilian authority and the military that allowed the country to be able to go for between 10 to 15 years with a smooth um, uh, governance process that strengthened both the security services, but also the democratic institutions. The second tool that I think members of parliament have is public hearings. Because as we all know, in this democratic dispensation in many countries, people aspire to be elected into parliament from different fields. There are teachers, there are lawyers, there are women uh, advocates, uh, there are even medical doctors, engineers who get elected by their constituents to go into parliament. But while in parliament, you have an opportunity to acquire new skills. And one way to do that is by having public hearings where you invite experts, people with expertise in the subject matter of interest to testify before your committees and share their thoughts and views and opinions and recommendations with the parliament. That's how you enrich yourselves as member of parliament. And that's how you're able to get input from civil society, from academia, and from other subject experts into the work that you do at the national level, so that it will be relevant to society because of that input that you've gotten. The, the third, uh, I know I'm running out of time here, but the third tool, and I'll, I'll stop at that, which I think can be very relevant to members of parliament, is forming subject matter networks, cross-sectoral networks. For example, a network on climate change that involves parliamentarians, scientists in the country, civil society activists, and members of the relevant executive, uh, executive branch agencies. That allows for cross-fertilization of ideas that can enrich the parliament in its workings. Right now, across the Sahel, in the countries of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, the organization that I work with, the National Democratic Institute, did work with our partners from those countries to create these cross-sectoral networks where we have members of the executive branch, that's the Minister of Defense. We have the command, the high command of the security services, the chief of defense staff, or the chief of the military academy. 
or the National Security Agency that represents the fighting forces, members of parliament and society organizations. And what this is done in each one of those countries is that it is created a platform for discussions that help improve the resilience of the country and also enhance efforts to counter violent extremism, which we know is very rampant in parts of the Sahel. On top country specific networks, cross sectoral networks on resilience and countering violent extremism, we have been able to link up the three sectors from each one of the three countries into one sub regional network where representatives of these three sectors meet regularly to exchange ideas and brainstorm and arrive at recommendations on how they can improve resilience in their respective countries and also help their countries fight or counter violent extremism. The role that members of parliaments play in these networks is extremely crucial because it lends credibility to the institution of parliament. It gives them an opportunity to exert their leadership and it also gives them an opportunity to better inform themselves as they go about executing their critical functions of representation, legislative oversight, and legislation on behalf of their citizens. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this opening remarks, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Let's turn to um, Ms. Smitty, Kimberly. I wanted to ask you, we're eager to um, hear about your decades of work on African parliaments, including in Malawi and Botswana and in with SADC parliamentary forum. So let me ask you, um, for the parliamentary strengthening work that you did in those settings, what steps do you think that parliamentarians can take to incorporate citizen interests on defense and security issues into their work? And I'll turn it over to you for just um, six or seven minutes of opening thoughts. And then we'll do another round of questions with Chris and Kimberly after that. Sure, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So. Um, just to expand on what uh, Chris talked about, uh, site visits are incredibly important. Um, getting parliamentarians into different areas, we call it in Malawi, taking parliament to the people. And this really increases the trust that citizens have in their institution of parliament when they actually see what uh, parliament is doing, not just in plenary during debates, but really going out. And also it increases the MPs understanding of the real issues on the ground. So taking parliament to the people is incredibly important. Um, for the public hearings, um, this is something that, uh, that I've seen work incredibly well. But one of the things that um, often happens is, is that MPs might feel very uncomfortable. They're not sure if they are fully aware of the, the topics beforehand. So opening it up might be, um, you know, very nerve wracking. So one of the things that we've done is to have MP training or capacity building a couple of days in a closed door setting before the public hearing so that the MPs can um, be fully aware of the topics. Um, that, um, so in Botswana, we did one on climate change. And so the M by the time that the MPs um, had the public hearings, they, they were very much united on the types of questions and the types of data, that they, so they knew what to ask. Um, one of the things that I also have found is that, in, um, that when MPs are in the committees, they're much more nonpartisan. These are very technical environments. Um, and so this, is a, um, so this is also a way for parliamentarians, MPs want to show their work to ordinary citizens. So by opening up committee meetings to the public, it's a way of showing people how uh, the, the MPs are actually using their skills. So in some countries, the uh, standing orders um, provide for all committees to be open, and then they have to vote in order for it to be a closed door session for an issue like national security or something confidential. But in other countries, the status quo is to have a closed meeting and then you have to vote for it to be open. So that's an important factor. So we see the standing orders changing in countries so that more and more uh, committee meetings are open. 
Now with national security issues, um, oftentimes MPs are concerned that uh, these are issues that should be behind closed doors, but actually even the security sec sector themselves will say the vast majority of issues, especially surrounding budgets, um, should be open because these they, the, the military officials and others and police officers, they want the public to know uh, their conditions of service and perhaps their housing issues and shortages and things like that. So, so the vast majority of issues um, uh, we found that, um, uh, that uh, are conducive to open um, public hearings. The, the third uh, point I would say is um, just to follow what Chris said, that MPs are leaders in their constituencies, not just in plenary. And so the third point is um, having MP offices in, um, in their constituencies. And these offices are often staffed by nonpartisan staff members. So this is different, very different from party offices. Um, these are constituency offices. And, um, and this proves to be a very effective way for members of parliament to interact with their constituents um, and to address some of these constituency concerns. Um, uh, so I'll just stop there uh, uh, in the interest of time and I look forward to questions um, uh, that we can uh, respond to. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kimberly, um, for those opening remarks um, about some of these different techniques and tools or ideas that we can discuss more certainly, as you said, um, in the Q&A. Um, let me do one more round of questions with Chris and Kimberly before we open it up for Q&A with um, the parliamentarians and staffers who are with us today. So coming back to you, Chris, um, I'd like for you to spend maybe six or seven minutes on the following. Um, and it's a question that um, some of our participants are really keen for us to ask. Um, so we're coming to it here. Um, to what extent is having diversity within parliament itself, uh, particularly on gender or on age, important for advancing citizen security in African countries. Um, could you speak um, uh, about that for just about six or seven minutes and we'll get the conversation at least started on that topic. Sure, Th thank you very much, uh, Kat, for bringing up that very important question. Um, because as, you know, as the, uh, as, as Joe just demonstrated with Afrobarometer at the beginning of our panel, it's all about perceptions, the trust. You know, these are intangible uh, elements, trust, confidence. Um, people like to feel they belong. And the only way that citizens feel they belong side by side with the institutions that represent them is when they can see themselves in those institutions. And so the makeup of your parliament can very well tell whether you be able, you're going to be able to connect with citizens or conversely, whether citizens will be able to see that institution as representing their interest or not. And so with the diversity that is um, common in all of our countries across the continent, if citizens look at their parliament and they see homogeneity, either in age or in gender, or even in regional or ethnic representation, then you can be sure that the bulk of the citizens who don't identify with the makeup of the institution will not have faith or trust in that institution. So diversity is extremely important. And I think we can tackle it at two levels. First in terms of diversity within the parliament itself. I know that as members of parliament, you probably have no say in terms of how the rest of the institution can look like. But I also know that many of you are party leaders, you're leaders within your respective political parties. And so it is incumbent on political parties, our political parties to make sure that they can be inclusive in how they go about the candidate nomination process. So if a, 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 a political party for a parliament that has got 100 seats presents 100 male candidates, obviously 
that party is by that action, putting out the statement that it doesn't care for the rest of the 51% of the population that identifies as female or non-male. However, we have seen that the countries that have proportional representation are beginning to address as the electoral system, are beginning to address this issue in many ways. In some cases, going through legal, putting in place legal frameworks that allow the country to address some of the hurdles that have been longstanding over decades. And so some countries have embraced quarters to be able to make sure that at least at a minimum, there is sufficient gender, gender representation within the parliament. We hope that as, as leaders of your respective political parties, you can continue to make the case that for the, part, for the parliament to be taken seriously, it must be a true reflection of the face of the country. And this applies not just to gender, but it also applies to youth. Because as we all know, in almost all of our countries, close to 40% of our population is 25 years or younger. Which means that if you take the bar up to 35, 40 years or younger, you may find that 60, 65, or even in some cases, 70% of the population falls into that category. And so it is important to have their voices in parliament because they would identify, but also because it, it gives a holistic um, substantive package of information, basket of information to parliament to be able to do its work. You need the information that's relevant to the policies that you're trying to enact into legislation. And that can only happen when during debates, people bring their life experiences into the debates. That is one level of diversity. The other, the second level of diversity is more in your hands as members of parliament, is in what happens within parliament once you've been sworn in and you now sit as members of parliament, how do you go about your committee assignments? And we have seen, unfortunately, that in a number of parliaments, there is bias towards women sitting on the defense committee, towards youth sitting on the defense committee. And so even for the few women who get elected or the few young people who get elected, they don't get the committee assignments that allow them to make meaningful contribution to discussions around security sector reform or security sector governance. And I think that is one area in which you all can play a strong role, positive role in convincing your party caucuses to be sensitive to these matters when they do the committee assignments and also the leadership of the National Assembly to know that our women MPs, our young MPs are just as interested in these issues and are just as knowledgeable about these issues as their male counterparts. And I think that if we get this right, then the work of our defense committees or our intelligence committees or the committees that exercise oversight over the police, the prison system and other uniform services into a holistic, you know, um, a holistic basket of information that would strengthen within the institution of parliament. And so diversity, it's really crucial. And as we move forward, we're going to see that it's going to become even more and more necessary. We have just gone, the world has just gone through the pandemic of COVID-19. For over two years, parliaments have had a very difficult time meeting. And in some countries, they've been able to hold virtual meetings. But what we've discovered during this two year period is that the younger generation of Africans have really gotten ahead of the game because they're technology savvy and they're able to communicate better. And can you imagine if your parliament had a bulk of its members of parliament with that wealth of knowledge that they could bring to your discussions and debates even when a crisis hits, a crisis of this magnitude hits. So we have a vested interest 
in tapping into all the resources that our societies uh, provide and in seeing diversity on this beautiful continent as an asset of governance and not a liability. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for making these key points. I mean, um, who you consult affects the answers you get. It affects the information you get. Um, and, and so I think um, you're making a key point about how the, these diversity considerations, whether we're talking about gender or age or use of different kinds of languages, including African languages in the parliament um, or in consultations with citizens, you know, um, all these things affect what kind of information um, MPs and their staffers are able to get in order to then, you know, uh, represent citizen interests on defense and security issues. I will say um, we have people um, who have participated in the forum this year who are from um, ECOFEPA, the ECOWAS Parliament's um, female uh, caucus um, or parliamentary group um, who are thinking about these issues from their regional parliamentary standpoint and probably on, on the level of their national parliaments as well. We have quite a few young MPs from different countries who have joined us this year for the forum and who are bringing up some of these issues as well. And then um, we have certain MPs who have operated not just in English or French, the operating languages of the national assemblies in many places, but also in, um, you know, say the Wolof language or, or other African languages um, that, that also are important sometimes for elevating certain voices and, and points of view on um, from the citizens' perspectives on defense and security. So just wanted to recognize that. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a vibrant Q&A about these issues after we turn to Kimberly. And Kimberly, I want to give you the last word for six or seven minutes um, to expound a little bit upon some of these issues we've brought up today. So could you give us some examples um, from your work of how African parliamentarians have worked across party and coalition lines to advance security policies that are reflecting the interests of constituents? Um, so what are some good practices or new ideas um, that you can share with us through offering some of these examples of how um, this question of partisanship has come up throughout the forum. So it's a good way for us to end and, and um, to hear some examples from your standpoint in Southern African countries over the course of your career. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Yes, the issue of partisanship is one that is a challenge. Uh, and in plenary, uh, uh, partisanship is supposed to be there. It's supposed to be lively. It's supposed to be um, uh, where parties show their different positions. But during the committees, I think that's the time where we see, um, as I said earlier, where behind uh, closed doors sometimes, uh, you see um, MPs walking, uh, working across party lines. Um, one of the things for defense and security, I'll say uh, in, in Malawi, we've seen that um, turnover um, among staff members um, has been a challenge, but also among MPs. So um, constitutionally, the parliament of Malawi, the defense and security committee, the tenure for membership on that committee is for one year. So every year the MPs have to be reassigned. That's very different than all the other committees where um, the tenure is for the full term. So how committee membership is determined is incredibly important. And so one of the things that we've seen is where MPs have more security in their tenure on a parliamentary committee, you see the committees are actually becoming stronger. And that also provides for the members of parliament to get to know each other, to work across party lines, um, and to be more technical in their, um, in, in their uh, uh, work. Another uh, practice that we've seen um, over the years is um, when the committees actually hold their meetings. So because plenary is such a highly partisan time period, one of the things that in Malawi, the members of parliament do is they have all their committee meetings outside of that period. So way after plenary meets. And number one, that provides for all of the sentiments to cool down. But second of all, it provides the, um, the ability for MPs to, to work outside of the scrutiny of their party whips and their party leaders. So in, they have more freedom to work across those party lines. And then um, uh, another, uh, I'll just end with this point. One of the things that, um, that I think that um, over my years, I've really encouraged MPs is that, that 
you don't have to be an expert on everything. You're, um, and, and one of the challenges is, um, unlike the US Congress, where you have tons of staff members, um, virtually unlimited resources, um, an African MP is expected to be a budget expert, a technical expert, is expected to buy coffins in their constituencies. Um, you're expected to be a, a person with so many different hats. And that means that your job as an MP is one of the hardest um, uh, in, in any country in the world. Um, the work that African MPs do is just so much of a challenge. And that's the part of the work that the public doesn't know. Um, so one of the things that I think is, a, is an, an incredibly important issue for us to um, encourage uh, is to make sure that the work that you do that is across party lines is better publicized. So um, um, press briefings after the committee meets. So um, getting uh, the chairperson who's usually from the ruling party, but the vice chairperson who could be from the opposition and having those two together and talk about what that committee is doing and the site visits, it really changes the public's perception on how parliament operates when people are like, oh, oh, they're not just fighting in the chamber, but they're actually doing something uh, and they're making sure that that road gets built or they're making sure that that, that bridge gets repaired. Oh, okay. And so that to me is, the, um, is an incredibly important lesson. Thanks, Kat. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for sharing. Um, the Malawi example is a really instructive and interesting one about the timing of committee work um, in relation to plenary um, and, and other sessions. And then, um, yes, your point about um, involving the media and involving um, you know, that part of society and how communications or illustrations of what MPs work consists of besides the floor work um, is really important as well. So thank you for ending us on those thoughts.